Tonight, the White House shifting to an urgent tone in the battle against COVID-19 as a pandemic that appeared to be on the decline only one month ago is now surging all across the country, fueled by the contagious Delta variant. New infections rising in 48 states. The number of new cases per day up nearly 60 percent over last week as vaccinations, vaccination rates fall. The head of the CDC warning the virus has no incentive to let up and that Americans who are not vaccinated should take the Delta variant seriously. Also tonight, the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi considering adding GOP Congressman Adam Kinzinger, a vocal critic of the former president, to the January 6th Select Committee. But first, President Biden making a lot of news in our CNN town hall, and I asked him about right-wing attacks that claim he doesn't support police. How do you respond to Republicans who try to paint you and your party as anti-police? They're lying. <laughs> what about defunding the police, though? Because there's no, a, I've the never, never, never said defunding the police. Look, I don't know any community, particularly the communities that are in the most need and the poorest and the most at risk that don't want police. They want police, though, to look at them as equals. The president also making it clear that he is still against killing the filibuster, even with voting rights on the line. If it's a relic of Jim Crow, it's been used to fight against civil rights legislation historically. Why protect it? There's no reason to protect it other than you're going to throw the entire Congress into chaos and nothing will get done. All right. Nothing at all will get done. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot at stake. The most important one is the right to vote. And here's what he said about Republicans trying to pretend the insurrection wasn't a threat. I don't care if you think I'm Satan reincarnated. <laughs> the fact is, you can't look at that television and say nothing happened on the 6th. You can't listen to people who say this was a peaceful march. CNN's Jason Carroll sat down with voters in Cincinnati of all different political backgrounds to talk about it. I thought the first thing we were going to talk about would be pandemic, but it's crime and January 6th. I, for one, was disappointed uh, with his stance with policing and feel like it was a move in the wrong direction. There was a part where it almost sounded like he was saying, I want to make policing great again. What he did say is he said he was not in favor of defunding the police. Resources are the, are the greatest indicator of safety in our communities. And um, I think far too often we're ending up with resources uh, not in the hands of the people that really need it. You hear it from the from those on the left to on the far left to defund the police. So I just want to be clear: is that something that you're in favor of? Yes, I am in favor of uh, defunding the police. I, b I believe that those funds would be much better used um, in our communities. I would respectfully mm -hmm. disagree with my friend. I happen to think the reason crime has shot up so much in our cities is because of the attacks on the police and the defend the defund the police movement. But once again, when you look at what Trump did, he was actually encouraging cops to be rough with people they picked up. Remember he said shove their, you know, heads in the car. That kind of talk is dangerous. So I'm just grateful that we have a president now that has some respect for the rule of law. I see some of you nodding your heads to what Phil was saying. To be fair with um, what President Biden said with the increased funding, he did talk a lot about adding psychologists and social workers as co-responders, which I think is a good thing because they can help maybe diffuse some of these situations. But he also talked about accountability and holding officers to account when they cross the line. I would, I would echo that. I, I'm not a supporter of um, defund the police as as a tagline, as a as an end goal, I would say definitely increase accountability. I think that, you know, there's a huge disconnect between officers and the community in which they serve. And, you know, one thing that I remember growing up is seeing an officer walking up and down, you know, our, our local streets. And, you know, he knew uh, more about uh, the neighborhood gossip than most of us because he was engaged and, you know, he was able to diffuse things kind of before they started. Let's remember something. When people in my party, the Republican Party, uh, uh, accommodate or refuse to attack, criticize those who attacked the Capitol on January 6th, you can't turn around and then talk about being tough on crime. Mm -hmm. I think it's shameful right. that so many people in my party 
are excusing what happened on January 6th. I mean, how much are you guys, do you think that's something that's still being debated and talked about? There's a lot of mis misinformation that's out there. I think the hard part about it is some of the misinformation about what happened on January 6th and like partnered with, I feel like some people are just playing like ignorance is bliss. There was a woman who's running for my local city council that was there, not, not necessarily an insurrectionist, but was there and was in our local news talking about how it was just a nice protest and that, that, they, that they weren't violent when she was there. And that's just as bad. There's a crisis in this country bad. when it comes to facts yeah. and oh. what actually happened. So they want us to forget. They want us to forget it happened. They don't want to protest it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hold them accountable. There are too many Republicans today that don't have the guts to speak out against the big lie. Why is that? It's cowardice, I'll tell you why. Because we have a system, uh, a lot of it has to do with gerrymandering. Essentially what's happening with this suppression of the vote that's going on all over the country is what they want to do is they want to choose their voters instead of letting the voters choose them. And it's, our, our democracy is broken. And that's one of the things I was so frustrated with Joe Biden when it came to the filibuster conversation. There's this cognitive dissonance that exists where he's faithful that things will turn around. So what should President Biden do about that? I mean, we have to get rid of the filibuster so government can function. See, I sensed that, though, from, mm -hmm. like, Don when he questioned him, right, at mm -hmm. the town hall. And I was like, Joe knows what he's doing. He's, he's been doing it for 36 years. We have to trust that he has to cater somewhat to the Republicans. He has to cater somewhat to make a middle ground. And that was the best thing about his message last night, united. If we don't do it together and we keep fighting these extreme rights and lefts, we're never going to get it done. So don't worry about the fil filibuster part. we got to move past that. History is repeating itself, and we're not standing up to change that. And so the question is, how do we, how does Biden, how does the, the government collectively come together to say what is the path forward and how do we get there so that we're not going backwards in that process. So, so let me ask you something. Are you satisfied with what you've heard so far from this administration in terms of what they want to do about voting rights? I'm not, no. I, I think that there's so much more that needs to be done. I think that there's a lot that needs to be, more, more needs to be in concrete. Nobody should be surprised, by the way, about these attacks on voting and voter suppression. Right. Because look what happened when Trump was in the office. What did he do? He praised dictators like Erdogan in Turkey and Putin and Duterte in the Philippines. He praised brutal dictators. So who does he look up to? In my mind, voting rights and um, I want to say tossing out the filibuster, but amending the filibuster go hand in hand. If there's a portion of our society that doesn't feel heard and, and when they go to the ballot box, and don't have access to the ballot box, then yeah, but that, Neil, that the filibuster is off the table. It's a, it's a, Biden so, has made it very clear he's not going to do that. It will create it. chaos. But you say I say amending it, making Republicans, making anybody who wants to filibuster advocate um, on the Senate floor for as long as they want to hold that floor, advocate for their position. It's so like the, this whole idea of creating chaos. We just had <laughs> our Capitol under attack. <laughs> Congress is in chaos already. Well, what Biden actually said was we need to bring back the talking filibuster. Right. And so that you can't just make a phone call from your office and kill a bill. That you have to go to the floor, get up there and show your conviction and you know, explain why you're obstructing progress and why you're trying to keep Americans from voting. Biden is leading us in a path to get to that place where we are moving forward, where we are sitting down and listening to people with differing opinions, because that's what you do when you're an adult. Absolutely. You have conversations, and you don't have to agree on everything, but you Absolutely. figure out the things that make the most sense, yep. and you move forward, because you're an adult. I think we can't continue to compare Joe Biden to possibly the worst president ever, right? I, I understand it is, yes, it is absolutely refreshing to not have Trump anymore, but Presidencies are short, and it takes time for, for policies to enact and actually manifest and change people's lives. And we have to get serious about taking white, dismantling white supremacy from this country by having systemic barriers like the filibuster, which systemically block out the voices that frankly put Joe Biden there without black people showing up in large numbers, Joe Biden wouldn't be in this position. 
And if we allow these voting rights to be eroded, I guarantee he, him or whoever runs as the Democratic nominee next time won't be in this position again. We're dealing with, he was right about one thing, we're dealing with Jim Crow 2.0 right now. And mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not, beha it, it, we're not uh, I, I'm disappointed in not seeing the urgency and the gravity to fight back against that. Um, He's just okay. kind of moderate I, about I, it. I, but I love this you know? passion. I, I yeah. love this passion. But I'm also, I, I'm afraid because, I mean, we talked about it before we got out here and started talking. You know, we had to pick a person that could beat Trump. We had to get in first, right? But he's done a lot in what in what you're saying up here in that we're starting to come together. We're starting to have these conversations. We're acting like mature people again. I can sit next to him mm -hmm. and we can talk and not hate each other, right? You can't just hit reset. You can't just say everything's fixed overnight. You can't be extreme. We have to still cater to the old white guys, right? I get what you're saying and I feel it and I wanna do it too, but how? I don't understand how Obama's vice president uh, can't see this bigger picture that we don't have much time. We may very well lose the next uh, congressional election and be in gridlock. We don't have much time to be able to make transformational systemic change in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And it's like they're not, Democrats and Republicans are not playing the same game right now. So I hear what you're saying, I completely respect it and like I get your frustration, but at the same time I think there has to be the understanding throughout the whole country that change is the kind of change that we're looking for, it doesn't happen overnight. Absolutely. And also some of this change, Biden can't do. I would push back against my friends on the Democratic side who are kind of pushing for the liberal left policy, that that's priority. See, I think the greatest danger to this country right now is Trumpism, more so than any policy. And if they're able to suppress the vote, uh, whatever policy you care about, if they're able to attack our rule of law, and we've become one of these countries like Turkey and others that have really become right wing, be really dictatorships, it doesn't matter what you stand for. So I think all of us, Republicans and Democrats, have to make the decision. We are gonna put country ahead of party. Wow, Jason Carroll joins me now. Jason, look, I have all these questions prepared, but my, what did you think? That's what I wanna know, what did you think? Well, a couple of things, um, and you heard part of it there, Don. I was really surprised that the first thing that this group didn't want to talk about was the pandemic. I thought that would be first on their list. But their real feeling is that the president and his administration has a handle on, handle on that in terms of how the country is responding and how the country is moving forward. What they were really concerned about, and you heard a lot of it there, the deep concerns were about the misinformation that is spreading across the United States, the lies that are being told about the election, the lies that are being told now about what happened on January 6th, uh, they, they realize that the president acknowledges that the misinformation is out there, but the feeling is really that this president and that this administration doesn't really have a handle on how to combat all the misinformation that's out there. Mm -hmm. And Don also, but they were very animated, though, when it comes to voting rights. And um, I, I found it very fascinating. I think her name is Sarah Jason. When she said, I can sit next to yep. you and you can sit next to me and we can disagree with each other and not hate each other. What a great place for us to be because not so long ago, that didn't happen. That could not happen. People were yelling at each other, right. I hate you. They couldn't have a conversation. And Sarah is, describes herself as a conservative. She's a Republican. She's a farmer. Uh, and as you say, that's where we are now. I agree with you, and I think the, the group would agree with you, the panel would agree with you. Their concern is, Don, is where are we going to be two years from now? Where are we going to be three years from now? Where are we going to be during the next presidential election? And it's a real deep concern that they have. Jason, I'd love to see more of these on our network and everywhere else, because for a long time we did, you know, what's the Trump? Me too. Before Me Trump, too. right? What is it? Oh, the Trump supporter. <laughs> what's the Trump supporter like? Then he was elected. Oh, we need to know the Trump voter. Now he's out of office and we're still doing, oh, the Trump voters, what are they thinking? Well, perhaps we should be doing that with the Democrats as well. Jason, you did a great job. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So. Thanks, Generations Don. of Americans fought and died for one of the most sacred rights, the right to vote. And now we have seen that right is under assault all across the country. Is President Biden protecting the filibuster at the expense of progress on voting rights? We'll talk about that.